All right, now <clears throat> we're now more or less completing the first part of the course where we discuss uh, mainstream uh, philosophy of mind in the terms that mainstream philosophy of mind finds acceptable or common. And you can see from what you've read so far that the leading problem is how to accommodate subjectivity, how to, how to accommodate consciousness in a world that we know is physical. A world consists of physical particles. And most of the efforts uh, that I've asked you to read are various sorts of, of intellectual gyrations of people attempting to do that. Uh, and as you know, they break into two broad kinds, uh, the materialist reductionist kind, which includes behaviorism and strong AI and type-type identity and token-token identity and functionalism, including computer functionalism and all the rest of it. And I hope I have been patient enough to refute all of those. But on the other hand, the other guys don't seem to be better off. Uh, they include uh, dualism of various kinds and uh, property dualism and substance uh, dualism uh, as the two uh, most, uh, 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 as the uh, two general categories. Now what I've been urging is the way to solve this problem is to go back and look at the very terminology in which we stated it. And the assumption is that if consciousness is not reducible uh, to the physical, if it isn't reducible to brain processes, then it's not a part of the physical world. And I'm saying that's clearly a mistake. It is a part of the physical world. But what that shows is that these categories of physical and mental uh, are no longer useful for us. They were evolved. They were designed to oppose to each other. The physical was supposed to be non-mental, and the mental was supposed to be non-physical. And if you could break out of that assumption, then I think you get a rather easy solution. Well, easy. You get a possible solution to the problem, because you can see that consciousness is just a biological feature, like digestion or photosynthesis. Well, why is it such a big deal? Well, it has this peculiar property, Namely, it's got a subjective ontology. It only exists insofar as people actually experience it. Uh, yes, and that's just a fact. I mean, it's just, that's just how the world works. Uh, as I, 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 cows I can give milk, I, so brains can produce consciousness, and it will, I guess if we were obsessed with uh, milk, it would seem an, uh, an amazing, mystical, mysterious fact that mammals can do this, uh, but in fact they can. And similarly, with uh, brains of a certain type, we don't know where, how far down the phylogenetic scale it goes, we know that brains like our own can produce consciousness. And then if you've got that far, if you give me that much, that brains do it, uh, that it's real, that it's irreducible for a rather uh, trivial reason, namely it's got this first person ontology, it's so to speak a grammatical reason uh, that it's irreducible uh, to anything that has a third person or objective ontology, uh, then it seems to me the other two features follow quite naturally. Uh, it's realized in brains, it's both caused by brains and realized in brains, uh, and finally, it can itself function causally, like other, like other higher level features, such as the, uh, the feature of this table that it has solidity, uh, so consciousness can uh, function causally, uh, because it's grounded in lower level uh, microstructures, uh, and it functions causally as a higher level feature, in the same way the explosion in your car cylinder functions causally or uh, uh, the solidity of the table functions causally. So I think if you can just shake loose of the, uh, shake out of the Cartesian categories, if we can get rid of the, uh, the assumptions that gave rise to the problem in the first place, then I don't think uh, that it's a mysterious uh, a problem. I mean, it, of course, it's a strange and wonderful thing that consciousness exists, but it's a strange and wonderful thing that the universe exists at all, or that life exists, or, or that uh, yeah, they, uh, the Earth continues to support life like our own. So I do think, yes, we ought to, uh, of course, be struck by the amazing qualities of the universe, and one of the amazing qualities is the existence of consciousness. 
Uh, but now, uh, after we're struck by it, let's go to work as philosophers and see how it fits in. Okay, so that's uh, uh, my uh, solution to the famous mind-body problem. Now, I thought, uh, before we go on, we ought to review uh, where we are with Descartes' problems. I mean, uh, most of our efforts have been devoted to one problem, exactly mind and body. Uh, and what I'm suggesting is if you put the problem in that form where mind means consciousness, uh, then you've uh, you got a problem. Uh, then you're not going to be able to solve the problem. You have to be able to see consciousness as just a part of the physical world, a part of the physical world that has subjectivity, uh, but that's n another way of saying that the whole terminology of physical and mental is obsolete. Okay, that's Descartes' problem number one. Now we got half a dozen more to go, so let me go and, and see where we are with these other problems. Questions about that, because that's really the central message, the central problem of the first part of the course. And I have patiently, well, I don't know how patient I am, uh, but I've gone through a whole lot of, of uh, works that I don't think are really uh, very impressive. I mean, can there really be people who deny the existence of consciousness? Yes, there are. Uh, uh, people who deny that they're, you know, you want to rush up and pinch these guys uh, at, at public meetings where they do this. And Dave Chalmers uh, was uh, uh, threatened to do that once at a meeting of the annual consciousness jamboree. Um, every two years in Tucson, they have a big uh, session on consciousness. And the problem with consciousness as a subject of conferences is it brings a, a, a types of people out of the woodwork that you don't normally see at philosophy conferences. If you have a conference, let's say, on the application of quantificational uh, logic uh, to iterated modalities, you get a lot of uh, boring middle-aged guys. But if you have a, a conference on consciousness, wow, uh, you get people that whom you cannot imagine. Uh, anyway, so you get a couple of thousand people. I don't think they get that many more, but when I first addressed Tucson, it was at least 2,000 people there. Overflow, huge auditorium, people out in the streets. <laughs> uh, you get an awful lot of people there, and all sorts of strange and wonderful things are said. Among them is said, though very few people come out and say these words, consciousness does not exist, but it's clear that's what they think. I mean, I think it's clear that Dennett uh, thinks that. I, he, he wrote a book about this that I reviewed for the New York Review of Books, and it wasn't until, I think it was page 354, that he finally says, yeah, well, what consciousness is really, uh, it's a, a von Neumann computer program implemented in connectionist architecture. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, and when challenged, why didn't you say that on page one, uh, he said, well, he didn't think he'd get a very sympathetic hearing for his account of consciousness if he said that on page one. But anyway, have a look at his book, Consciousness Explained. One of the reviewers called the review, Consciousness Denied. Uh, but I, 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 anyway, you've had enough a chance to read different sorts of people on this to see the different possibilities. Okay, now I want to go on with the rest of Descartes' problems and see where we are and what we should do next. One of the problems we're going to have to face is the unconscious. My God, I mean, we had one mind-body problem with consciousness in the brain. How about the unconscious? Do we have two Cartesians' problems? Well, we'll get to that. Okay, questions about... Uh, the great mind-body problem, the relation of consciousness to the brain, the relation of mental life to the physical world. Anybody, uh, now's your chance uh, to get in a last question or a last objection or, or whatever. Okay, I'm going to go on then with the, with the uh, uh, other Cartesian issues. Now, the second problem, and I haven't said much about it, is the problem of other minds. And that, as I said... Uh, is the problem of how do I know that anybody else is conscious? How do I avoid solipsism? The view that I am the only conscious being. Uh, certainly I have a, uh, an epistemic relation uh, to my consciousness that I don't have to yours. I, I don't, I, I feel my pains in a way that I can't feel your pains. So how do, why am I so confident that other people are conscious? Now, the standard answer to that is um, that I know by their behavior that they're conscious. Uh, but I think that answer is wrong. Um, I, if you take uh, animals, and I'm very confident that Gilbert is conscious, 
um, it's clear that uh, animals have consciousness, but they don't really uh, behave quite like human beings. Uh, when I get home, uh, Gilbert uh, wags his tail and licks my hands and generally shows enthusiasm. Uh, but I don't know anybody uh, who, when I, I greet them, wants to wa wag their tail or lick my hands. I mean, uh, I can tell that he's a happy doggy. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, uh, the, the reason that I can tell that Gilbert is conscious is not just that his behavior requires me to postulate consciousness. I might design a robot dog that wags its tail and licked my hand with its iron tongue. Uh, but all the same, what Gilbert has, what I can see in the case of Gilbert, is he has a structure relevantly like mine. These are, those are his eyes, these are his ears, this is his skin. And I don't have to have a fancy theory of doggy physiology. Uh, I don't have to know anything about his brain, uh, but it's pretty clear that he's got a structure that's relevantly similar to my own. But now then the question arises, well, how far down the phylogenetic scale do you want to go? How about fleas? Are they conscious? We don't know. And I think the answer is it's probably not worth worrying about it until we know more, a lot more about neurophysiology. Uh, my bet is that consciousness will go fairly far down the phylogenetic scale. But how far, I, I don't know. I mean, it's clear that mammals are conscious. Uh, and I would want to say uh, that all sorts of other animals are conscious. How about fish? Yeah, fish are conscious. Um, now, I don't want to think too much about it uh, because I'm afraid if I really thought about it, I'd have to become a vegetarian. Uh, and I'm putting that off as long as I can. Um, but in any case, it seems to me pretty obvious uh, that uh, uh, other animals have consciousness, and it's not useful to worry about how far down it goes. Our fleas conscious is not something we ought to worry too much about, because we don't know enough about the, the, uh, the uh, neurobiology of the flea. I'll take questions in a second. Uh, okay, so here's the solution I'm giving you. The solution to the other mind's problem is not behavior. The solution to the other mind's problem is behavior plus structure, and in particular, their combination. It's when their structure, when the structure of the animal is relevantly like yours, and you can see that the behavior is appropriate to the structure, uh, that you become completely confident that the animal is conscious. However, I think there is an element of uh, uh, of truth in skepticism about other minds, and that is, I think, the other minds problem is the only traditional philosophical skeptical problem that has a kind of personal realistic grip. We always feel, even with people that we're most close to, that there's an area of their life uh, that is for forever beyond our complete comprehension. Even people we're very close to have ways of surprising us, have ways of doing things that we would not have uh, uh, predicted. And that suggests to me uh, what I think is, in general, the case, uh, that there is uh, a gulf uh, between ourselves and other people. Uh, and that with, with people you don't know well, uh, you really don't know what it feels like to be those people. I have no idea uh, uh, what it felt like to be, let's say, Princess Diana. Uh, or uh, Louis the Louis the Fourteenth. Well, Louis the Fourteenth. Yeah, I can kind of imagine. Uh, well, all those women, uh, for example. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Louis the Fourteenth. I can kind of imagine what life was like uh, for him. But with Princess Diana, I have no idea what it was like to be. What, what was she anorexic or bulimic or whatever? She had one of those inic uh, ailments uh, that led to uh, too much skinniness. Uh, but in any case, I, I, and I have, I'm, I know Gilbert pretty well. I mean, we've been at it for a long time now, Gilbert and I. So I have some conception of his doggy life, but within limits. I mean, yes, I can kind of imagine what it's like to be a dog, but there are s serious limits uh, to my uh, imaginative capacities. Now, let me say one other thing about other minds, and then I'll stop for questions. It's a mistake to think, and this is a very deep mistake in our culture, to think that our attitude to reality is essentially epistemic, that we're busy going around solving the problem of other minds, that I came in this class and said, yes, they are conscious. 
or at least some of them are. I didn't do that. I take it for granted. It's part of the background. It's like, how do I know that this table is solid? Well, it's just not, my relation to reality, for the most part, is not epistemic. I'm not going through life solving the problem of other minds. I take it for granted that other people are conscious, just as I take all sorts of other things for granted. Now, how is that possible? Am I not being epistemically irresponsible to take these things for granted? I'm going to get to that when I t tell you about intentionality. But the fact is, we can't cope with life without presupposing what I call a background, a set of capacities, a ways of behaving. When I walked over here from my office, I didn't have to check, is the ground really solid? Will it support me? I, after all, have I solved the problem of induction? Do I really know that the fact that the ground supported me yesterday is, gro is grounds for supposing it will support me today? Basically, I don't adopt an epistemic attitude. Occasionally, I do. The damn car won't start, and I want to know what's wrong with it. Why is it exactly that it won't start? And so I go into an epistemic stance. But for the most part, when things are working well, I don't go into an epistemic stance. When somebody comes to my office, I don't say, First, you got to prove you're conscious. Then we'll discuss your grade. I don't do that. I mean, maybe if I were more cautious, I would. And I have a lot less discussion about grades. Uh, but uh, it's a mistake to think. And our philosophical tradition encourages mistake, is that our basic relation to reality is epistemic. OK, I saw some hands up. There was a hand up over here. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. OK, suppose we really invented a pretty plausible looking robot. Uh, we put a fur coat on it, and we, uh, we put in recordings of actual dog barks so that when it opens its mouth to bark, out comes not just an indistinguishable from dog bark, but an actual recording of a dog bark. Uh, could we be fooled? Yeah, we might. We might be fooled. But the point is, always remember to separate the epistemology from the ontology. The ontology is a question of what actually exists. Is the animal conscious? And that's not the same as the question, how would you tell? How would you uh, be deceived? You, the animal might be conscious, and you think it's not conscious. Uh, the animal, you might think the animal was conscious when it's not conscious. And by the way, this is not just a theoretical uh, problem, this is a practical problem, because there are <clears throat> ailments, there are brain diseases that people get where they're fully conscious but cannot behave. They, they can't move a muscle. The Guillain-Barre syndrome is a classic case of this, uh, where the guy is totally conscious but can't give any indication. He's totally paralyzed. And the people who come out of this, who recover from it, say it's absolutely terrifying to be in this situation because you're fully conscious, but you can't convince anybody that you're conscious because they can't detect any, uh, any behavior on your part. Uh, OK, so the answer is we might be fooled by a clever robot dog, but there are two separate questions. One is, would we be fooled? And secondly, what are the actual facts? And the actual fact are that if the dog is conscious, then it is having some qualitative subjective state much like our own. What would be conclusive? I think it would be absolutely conclusive if we had a neurobiological theory of consciousness uh, and we could identify such and such features of the animal's brain are sufficient for consciousness. So I had a question earlier, how about fleas and termites, are they conscious? We don't know, but how might we settle it? Well, suppose we discover uh, that a consciousness in ourselves and other higher animals was always correlated with a certain neurobiological structure that we'll just abbreviate as ABC. And we discovered that termites had ABC, but fleas didn't. And we could account for the flea behavior uh, on the basis of reflexes and tropisms and, and the standard sorts of things like that. Uh, whereas in the case of the termites, uh, their ABC uh, basis was relevantly like other animals that produce consciousness, then it seems to me that would be pretty conclusive. Then it would be a reasonable hypothesis that the termite is conscious and the flea isn't. So the main message I want to get across in response to this question is a very good question, is that another persistent mistake in Western philosophy is to confuse epistemology with ontology, to confuse the question, how do you know, with what it is that you know when you know. 
And the answer in the case of consciousness, we might be fooled. Um, uh, but the, there's still a factual question. Is the beast or is the robot conscious or not? Somebody else had a hand up. Yeah. Yes, I think that I, in the case where the guy has <coughs> the Guillain-Barre syndrome, I, the guy has all of the mechanisms necessary to produce consciousness. He has a brain uh, mechanism that's functioning and produces consciousness. But I, his I, 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 a nervous system uh, doesn't enable him to make any muscle movements. That's just enough to keep him breathing, uh, but he can't... Uh, tell us anything, can't move any muscles, he's totally paralyzed. And it it's then becomes a factual question. Is the guy conscious even though he can't behave in a way uh, that uh, is appropriate for conscious? And the answer is yes, it's conclusive because the people come out of it and they tell us what actually happened. We actually have a theory, you can look it up, uh, 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 about how this works in the clinical cases. It's spelled guillain -Barre. There's an axon on the ballet. The, look it up, the guillain Barre syndrome. Not everybody who has that goes, has it in this extreme form, but it, it does exist. Now, I haven't looked at this stuff in about 20 years, um, but I actually have professional experts who will correct me if I'm mistaken. I hope I'm, I'm right about this, Nanique. If I'm not, she'll, I, 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 she'll blow the whistle. Uh, okay, other questions? These are very good. Yeah, at the back. Okay, no, I think this is the crucial difference, and Descartes was absolutely right to think the crucial feature that human beings have, that animals do not have, is language. Now, we now have a lot of investigation about uh, something like languages in other animals. The bee language is the most studied, but it's nothing like a human language. I, and when we get further along in the course, when I've given you a theory of intentionality, I'm going to have more to say about what language does for you. Uh, but among other things, it creates the situation we're now in. Uh, there are no bunch of doggies getting together to hold a, a large lecture class on the subject of doggy consciousness. Languages enables us to create money, property, government, marriage, universities, cocktail parties, summer vacations, lawyers, doctors. I mean, all of this other, all this stuff that exists, in a sense, only because we believe it exists. These pieces of paper are money only because we think they're money. To think they're money, you've got to have language. You have to have some way to represent it. And I'm going to say more about that. You're going to hear more about language when I get into intentionality. The picture that I want to give you is the animal has consciousness, and certain forms of consciousness have intentionality. And with certain types of intentionality, the animals evolve language. And human language is not like any other language known to me. Uh, there are uh, uh, interesting things that you can do with parrots where they can mimic a human language in certain ways. And that's, uh, some of those are quite remarkable, what uh, uh, the, the, the particular gray parrot did. Uh, and, uh, and we do have something like uh, a, a communication a signaling system that's something like language in the case of the bees. But for the most part, animals have signaling systems. They don't have language. Okay, other question. Yeah. If, this, if consciousness truly is um, a natural biological consequence, yeah. what is the evolutionary benefit? Why, why would it have been so yeah. conversion upon? Yeah, okay. No, this is a very deep question, and I will give a superficial answer because we just don't have a hell of a lot of time to devote to it. Uh, the question is, uh, if it's a biological phenomenon, why does it exist? What functions does it serve? Now, philosophers often ask this question as if, well, gee, that's hard to state the function of consciousness. The functions of consciousness are prodigious. We can't imagine our lives without consciousness. Take the famous four Fs of the standard biological textbooks of what are they, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and sexual intercourse are the famous four Fs. Uh, and all of them require consciousness. Try to do any of them while being totally unconscious. So uh, for human life, consciousness is essential. And what's the advantage? Well, you get a prodigious amount of information processing 
that, so to speak, both comprehensive and simultaneous. So you can be aware not only of what you're eating, but the conversation uh, that you're having, uh, the phone that's ringing in the background, uh, the plans to work on your income tax after you finish the meal. You can have a terrific amount of information all in one conscious field. And I remember I said that, that consciousness always uh, comes to us as part of a unified conscious field. So the evolutionary advantages to consciousness are overwhelming. It isn't just as a single thing. Uh, it's very hard for us to eat if we're unconscious. Uh, but there are all kinds of things that you can't do without consciousness. Yes, but now the answer goes to me. Here's the answer that comes back. You can imagine beings exactly like us that behave exactly like us, but are unconscious. Zombies. And if the zombies are possible, then there doesn't seem to be any advantage to consciousness. Okay. Now I have to say, remember the rules of the game of ev of. Uh, of uh, uh, isolating evolutionary functions. It's not enough that you can imagine science fiction. Though suppose somebody said, it's no good saying that the function of birds' wings is to enable them to fly, because they could fly with rocket engines. We could imagine birds evolve rocket engines. Yeah, you could, but that's science fiction. In the real world, birds can fly only if they got wings. And similarly, in the real world, uh, we can cope with, a, with the world in the way that we do only because we have consciousness and also language. I'll say more about language later. Uh, so the functions of consciousness are prodigious, and it's, uh, it's not an adequate answer to that to say, yes, but we could as a science fiction uh, exercise imagine beings who behave as well as we do without consciousness. No doubt we can, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about how the world actually works and the way it actually works is, if an animal doesn't have consciousness, it can't behave with anything like our degree of, of uh, cognitive power. And when I say cognitive power, that's already kind of fakey. Uh, it, it concedes too much. Our, uh, our ability to cope with the environment presupposes consciousness. OK, let's go on. Now we're going through the Cartesian uh, questions. And I'll, I've identified these two. Now a third one is the problem of skepticism and with it perception. And I'm not going to answer that yet, but I want to tell you uh, some of the difficulties. The problem of perception is the problem of how our conscious perceptual experiences relate to the external world. Uh, and for much of Western philosophy over the past three and a half centuries since Descartes, but working through Locke, Berkeley, Hume, Leibniz, Spinoza, Kant, and all the rest of it, the question has been one of how is it possible that we can have knowledge of the external world based on our perceptual experiences? Our perceptual experiences are inner, they go on in our minds, but the external world is outer. How can the inner mental reality of the perception give you knowledge of the external world? Now, I, I'm not yet ready to answer that question because I have to give you a theory of the intentionality of perception. But I want you to see what the problem is. The naive realist, that's this guy here, thinks that we actually see objects. Uh, the, the arrow represents the intentionality. The intentionality of the visual experience reaches right up to the object. Now, there's, that view is called naive realism, or uh, sometimes uh, um, there are other versions of, of, of names, but that's the basic name, naive realism. Uh, and that's supposed to be easy to refute by uh, uh, considering the cases of hallucinations or delusions. And then if it's the case that all you see is your own experience, then there's a question, what's the relation between the experience you do see and the object you don't see? And that's called representative realism, because the theory, they, the answer given by the representative realist is that the thing you do see, the idea or the sense datum, is a kind of picture. It represents the object you don't see. And that's called a representative theory, or sometimes representative realism. And this I, is just called normally naive realism because it says you just see objects naively, directly, without seeing a representation. Uh, so the, you see your own experience, 
but the experience resembles, I'll just write resembles here, the object, and that enables you to figure out how things are with the object. Now, this view, I think, hasn't got anything to rep uh, recommend it. And, and the reason that you can get this kind of resemblance is there's a causal relation. Uh, the object causes you to have the experience. I think that is not a plausible view, but it's been held by a lot of famous philosophers. I specifically, Descartes and Locke both held of representative realism, that you perceive your own experiences, your own ideas or impressions or sense data, but they give you knowledge of the world because uh, they represent it. They, they are pictures of it in certain ways. Now, uh, this view hasn't got much to recommend it because you can't make, so, make sense of this notion of resemblance if this part is invisible. So Berkeley, as far as I know, was the first philosopher in recent times, in the past uh, uh, several centuries, to say, let's get rid of all of that, and all you ever perceive are your own experiences. And that view is called, in, in Berkeley, phenomenalism, and in some versions, phenomenalism, idealism. Uh, not because it's, uh, it goes for high ideas, but uh, high ideals, but because it says the only things you can actually perceive are your own ideas. Reality consists in mental states. Reality is ultimately mental. Now, it's hard for me to take that view seriously, but in fact, it, its influence over the past several centuries has been prodigious. It was only about 100, maybe 110 years ago, at the beginning of the 20th century, that we began to overcome the influence of the idealism that begins with Berkeley and stretches through Hegel and Bradley and Royce. Uh, and if you want to see an intelligent defense of it, look at um, uh, Josiah Royce, uh, who was a professor in this university, uh, was the most famous American idealist, and he wrote a book called it. I think it's called the Origins of Modern Idealism. And it, it does give a, 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 as good a defense as you can make, but I don't think that it's very plausible in the end. His name is spelled like this, Royce. Uh, but other English-speaking uh, idealists, uh, the most influential in England was F.H. Bradley. And of course, the all-time champion of this type of idealism is Hegel. Uh, and there are other uh, uh, Germans whose names start with H uh, uh, that, uh, who are also idealists. Okay, I, I'm, I, I have not given you an account of perception. I gave you some hints. I gave you some slogans. We're going to come back to this. You cannot understand perception until you understand intentionality first because the key to understanding perception is to understand the character of the intentionality of perception, and you don't have enough apparatus for that. The greatest single disaster in the history of Western philosophy since Descartes, that's almost what, four, getting on to four centuries now, yeah, um, is uh, the rejection of naive realism uh, uh, and the idea that all you ever have perceptual access to are the contents of your own mind, are your own inner Cartesian mental events. And once you make that move, once you reject naive realism, to say all that you can ever actually perceive is in here, uh, then you don't have a solution to the problem of skepticism. Uh, but, and again, I have to give you a theory of intentionality before I can explain that. Okay, I want to go on with Descartes' questions. And as I said, I haven't given you a theory of perception. I've only given you some chapter headings. Now, the fifth thing, well, okay, if perception is bad news, uh, the next one is worse, and that's free will. <clears throat> and this was a problem for Descartes, but let me uh, take questions. Uh, uh, anybody want to ask a question about uh, perception? Yes. Sorry? Yeah, tenant sheet. Yeah, you're supposed to hand in a sheet. Oh, yeah, you want to hand it in now? Let's do it now. Okay, for fun. That way, people who come at the end of the, uh, at the hour... I just I pass your sheets to the to the um, uh, to the aisle. Uh, okay. Uh, while we're engaged in this serious intellectual exercise of taking attendance, I want to continue the discussion. 
Uh, the guy in the green T-shirt is doing heroic work back there. <clears throat> Why is there a problem? Uh, well, let's go through the steps. Why is there a problem about perception? There's a problem about perception because we have conscious perceptual experiences and they give us knowledge about a real world that in some sense lies on the other side of the perceptual experiences. How is that possible? What's the relation between the perceptual experience and the objects and states of affairs in the world that we perceive? All right, I think there is a fairly easy solution to that problem once you have a theory of intentionality. But the next one is tougher, and that's the problem of free will. Why do we have a problem of free will? We have a problem of free will <clears throat> because, <clears throat> on the one hand, we suppose that everything that happens in the universe must have a causal explanation of a sort that gives causally sufficient conditions. If you want to know uh, why the Cypress Freeway in Oakland collapsed, it collapsed uh, because of the Loma Prieta earthquake. The Loma Prieta earthquake uh, shook the earth all the way from Loma Prieta to Oakland. It damaged the foundations of the freeway, and that uh, caused the collapse of the freeway. And nobody can say things, well, it was kind of up to the freeway. If it wanted to collapse, it could, and if it didn't want to, it didn't have to. No, it, it had to happen that way. And we think that's characteristic of events, that they are determined. And we even think that's true of uh, public, uh, social, human events. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, there used to be a huge amount of uh, literature on the subject of the causes of the First World War. What was responsible uh, for the First World War? And there were all sorts of theories about the causes of the First World War. But one thing we would not have accepted would, be, would have been if somebody had said, uh, well, I enrolled as a graduate student in history, and I was going to do a PhD uh, about the cause of the First World War, and I discovered it didn't have any causes. Just one of those damn things. Uh, there were no causes of the First World War. We won't accept that. You won't get a PhD from this or any other university known to me. Maybe there's some deconstructionist universities where you might, but, but around here, in the universities that I respect, you cannot get a PhD by saying, well, it didn't have any causes. It's just one of those things that happened. You know, some damn things just happened. The First World War was one of them. We won't accept that. But if everything has a cause, and human actions are causes, then it looks like human actions must also be completely caused uh, in the same way as the collapse of the Cypress Freeway, or if I drop this cup of water, it will fall to the floor. Why do we think that human actions are any different from anything else? Well, the reason we think that is because we have a certain experience. We have the experience of making up our mind as to what we're going to do and then deciding to do something and then carrying out the decision. And in the course of that process, we have an experience of making up our mind under the presupposition that alternatives are open to us. I could have voted for that guy, but I voted for that guy. And in the next election, I could vote for this guy, but I could also vote for the other guy. We have a sense of alternative courses of action open to us. And that is a sense that there is a kind of causal gap between the causes of our action, the causes of our decision, and the actual decision and action. And I describe that by saying we sense a gap. We sense that the causes are not sufficient. And you might say, yeah, but that's probably wrong uh, that there's a gap. Uh, why don't we just face up to the fact that the causes are sufficient? Well, the answer is you can't live your life except on the assumption of the gap, except on, and Kant pointed this out, you have to live your life on the assumption of free will. You're in the restaurant and they present you with a menu, and you've got a whole bunch of things on the menu. The waiter comes around and say, well, what would you like? Uh, the, the lamb cutlet is exceptionally good today, but if you like the vegetarian dish, the risotto, we have ex excellent uh, vegetarian risotto. You can't say, look, I'm a determinist. 
I'll just wait and see what happens. I'll wait and see what I order. Que sera, sera. It's an Italian restaurant. Uh, and, and now, why can't you do that? Why can't you say, I'm a determinist. I'm not going to try to make up my mind because I know it's already made up. What I'm going to get is written in the book of history at the time of the Big Bang 13 billion years ago. It was written that I will get the vegetarian dish or that I will get uh, the lamb cutlet. So what's the point of making up my mind? Why can't you do that? Why can't you say that? And the answer is the refusal to exercise free will is only intelligible to you on the assumption that it is an exercise of free will. You cannot escape the presupposition of free will when you are engaged in decision making and voluntary actions. You have a sense of alternative courses open, but that's not just like that sense of alternative courses open to you is not just like a tickle, something that might go away, but rather it's a presupposition of rational decision making that alternative courses of action are open to you. You cannot act except on that presupposition. It's, if free will is an illusion, it's different from other illusions. If you become convinced that color is an illusion, you can lead your life on the assumption that objects aren't really colored, it's just a kind of systematic illusion. But you can't lead your life on the assumption that free will is an illusion, even if theoretically you're convinced that, that it is an illusion, because you still have to make up your mind and decide to do things. And even if you refuse to do that, the refusal is only intelligible to you I, on the assumption that you freely decide to refuse. I gave a lecture about this once in London, and I, I, I said, look, here's, there's a hypothesis, the hypothesis of determinism, uh, and we can't lead our life uh, on the assumption that that hypothesis is true. And a guy in the question period said, yes, but if determinism were established as a scientific fact, would you accept it? And I pointed out to him, look, think about that, what you're asking. If it is established as a scientific fact that there's absolutely no such thing as free rational decision making, would you freely and rationally decide to accept that there's no such thing as free rational decision making? It's a, there's a paradox about uh, a free will which you don't get in perception or digestion. There is no problem in philosophy about the freedom of digestion. Shall I digest or not? Uh, it's only a pizza to hell with it. Uh, 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 but there is a question of shall I marry that guy or not? I, or I, shall I vote for the Republicans or the Democrats? There are genuine questions. And there really is no freedom of perception. If I hold up my hand in front of my face, I can't say, well, it's up to me what I see. I can see a freedom of perception. I can see any damn thing I want. I do have a freedom. I can close my eyes, turn my head. But it, there is no philosophical problem about the freedom of perception. Why not? Perception is as much fun as anything else. Uh, but all the same, we have a problem of freedom of the will. We do not have a problem of freedom of perception or freedom of digestion. Now, Descartes' uh, solution uh, to this problem, I think, was uh, one of the weakest parts of his book. Uh, he says, well, uh, we just have a sense of our own freedom. Whenever we act, we have a sense of our own uh, freedom, and that's really all we need. We have a sense that alternative possibilities are open to us. Yes, we do have that sense. Uh, but we want to know, is it valid? Is it really, a, a, is there any ground uh, for the presupposition of freedom, granted that we do have that uh, a, a sense? Okay, uh, we're going to, I mean, I, I'm going to give you an account of that when I tell you about the nature of consciousness and intentionality. Now remember, only for a conscious being can there be a problem about the freedom of the will. Uh, and this is why. Uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you read the Freud and the Freudians, it's pretty clear that the idea they have is if you take your unconscious motivations, they deny you freedom because you can't be aware of what you're doing. But if you can bring the unconscious to consciousness, if you can become aware of all of your hang-ups, then you can act freely in a way that you cannot act as long as you have those. 
uh, uh, unconscious hang-up. So freedom seems to be, uh, uh, free will seems to be essentially tied uh, to consciousness, and we have to explain that relation, and I've hinted at part of it. What I've said, it, said is there's two kinds of consciousness. There's a kind of consciousness that involves an experience of the gap. There's active consciousness, uh, but there is also the kind of passive consciousness which you experience when you see something. Or when, for example, example when you ex uh, experience digestion taking place in your stomach, it's not up to you. Now, I don't know. There are Buddhists who tell me they can control their own digestion. I don't know if I believe it. But anyway, uh, I, I, for guys like me, I do not have freedom of digestion. If you do, well, pick another example. Okay. So active consciousness seems to be... Uh, I, I, seems to be the origin of the experience of freedom and the problem of freedom comes from the conflict between the experience of the gap, the experience of active consciousness, and our general conviction uh, that the universe is completely determined. Now, in the past, well, almost a century now, uh, it, it turns out at the most fundamental level, physics is not deterministic. At the quantum level, it's not deterministic. But it looks like the quantum level is no help to us with the problem of free will, because what quantum indeterminism gives you is randomness. And freedom of the will is not the same as randomness. My, my actions, if they're free, are not just random actions. You're going to hear more about that later. I'm just telling you what the problem is now. So we don't, I haven't solved the problem of perception, and I haven't solved the problem of free will. Uh, the next two, I think, are fairly easy, but they were serious problems for Descartes. And one is animals. Do animals have consciousness? And Descartes' answer was no, they don't. The proof is that they don't have language. Uh, but the reason they couldn't have consciousness is that all they have is a body. But we ha our bodies are not conscious for Descartes. So when he says animals are not conscious, that's not as crazy as it sounds. Because if an animal were conscious, it would have to have a conscious body, since all it's got is a body. But our bodies are not conscious either. If I feel a pain in the toe, strictly speaking, the pain is not in my body, it's in my soul. Only souls can be conscious for Descartes. So I think that is, a, 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 well, I don't want to say preposterous, but that's an implausible account. And, but the reason he's forced to it is that he thinks that material entities can't have experiences. The only entity that can have conscious experiences is a mind or a soul, a mental substance. And animals don't have a soul. Uh, and the proof they don't have a soul is they can't talk. Now, I, what's the answer to Descartes? Well, the answer uh, that's implicit in everything I've been telling you is all of our conscious states are caused by neurobiological processes in the brain, and animals have brains. Uh, indeed, uh, in the case of the higher animals, they have brain that's very much like ours. Uh, the chimpanzee's brain is distressingly similar to ours. Uh, it looks like we haven't got much neuronal, or, or for that matter, DNA advantage over the chimpanzee. So it's pretty clear that if our brains are capable of producing consciousness, then many animal brains are as well. So I think Descartes' answer is inadequate, and if we reject the dualism, there's an obvious answer that animals are conscious, or at least a, a, a lot of species. We don't, as I said earlier, we don't know how far down the phylogenetic scale it goes. Another problem for Descartes was sleep. Uh, if the, a, a, a substance has an essence, and the essence makes the substance the kind of substance that it is, then there's no way that the substance can lose its essence. The essence of mind is consciousness, so if we lost our consciousness, we would cease to exist. We'd stop existing altogether. So how is Descartes going to account for sleep, the fact that we do become unconscious? And his answer is uh, that uh, we're never fully unconscious in sleep. There's always some minimal level of dreaming. Well, we now have much more sophisticated accounts of all this, and we think 
and there's a lot of pretty good sleep research that goes on in this university. Uh, but we think that REM sleep, is a, rapid eye movement sleep, is associated with consciousness in a way that, that deep, slow wave sleep is not. And it seems perfectly possible uh, for a human being to become totally unconscious. I'm not sure that that's right, uh, that there isn't some level of consciousness in normal sleep. But I'm pretty sure that when you go into a coma, or under a general anesthetic, and a general anesthetic is a kind of chemically induced coma, uh, there it seems to me you are totally unconscious. What's the difference between sleep and general anesthetic? Well, one difference is this. When I have been asleep and I wake up, I have a kind of sense of how long I've been asleep. I mean, not to the last minute, but if I wake up in the middle of the night, I'm aware that I've been asleep uh, for some hours, but not an entire night. But with a, if you come out of a general anesthetic, you have no sense of how long you've been under the, the general anesthetic. So there are differences in the experience, uh, if you can call it that, of being under a general anesthetic and just being in a sound, dreamless sleep. Even in a sound, dreamless sleep, you get some sense of the passage of time. And I think this is an exciting area of research, and I, I just hope we learn more about it. There, as I said, there is a lot of sleep uh, research uh, going on right now. It's kind of an exciting area of psychology as we speak. Okay, now those are Descartes' problems. Uh, he did not have an adequate account to the problem of animals or the problem of sleep, but I think we can see once we abandon his Cartesian dualism, once we abandon the idea that we're essentially a mental substance, uh, then it seems to me we get a rather easy solution to those problems. Animals can have consciousness insofar as they have causal mechanisms capable of producing consciousness. Uh, and there's no special problem about uh, sleep. Uh, how is it possible uh, for us uh, to continue to exist while asleep? However, there is uh, there's an eighth problem for Descartes and for us, and that's the problem of the self and personal identity. And the problem about personal identity <clears throat> can be put in this form. What fact about me today makes it the same, makes me the same person as the, as the person who was here last Thursday? And you might say, well, it's the same body. Uh, that's the essential thing. That seems uh, partly right, <clears throat> but it doesn't seem that that can be entirely right because it makes sense to us to suppose that I might wake to find myself in a different body. You remember Gregor Zamsa uh, in Kafka's story of the metamorphosis uh, who wakes up to find himself in the body of a giant insect. Uh, even if that's science fiction, it's intelligible to us. It is intelligible that I might have a sense of myself in a different body. Uh, we don't know how to do brain transplants, but at least it makes sense to us to suppose that I might wait to find my brain was in a different body. So it can't be the body. Well, how about is it the brain? Is that enough? Uh, for the self. Well, and now here we get into science fiction. If my, suppose that your brain and my brain uh, have the relatively the same physiological structure, but that the programs in my brain were put into your brain and your brain was programmed into my brain so that uh, your body now remembers my childhood. That is, and, and you give my name as your name and I give your name as my name. There's no way to state this uh, neutrally because I'm begging questions when, when I put it this way. But I want you to see that there is a special problem about personal identity, which there isn't for, let's say, the identity of this cup, uh, the thing that makes this cup the same damn cup as I had here last week is it's spatial, temporally continuous. There's a continuously moving physical object. But it looks like for personal identity, more is involved than just uh, the spatial, temporal continuity of the body. Well, what more? Well, we have to answer that. Descartes thought he had a simple answer, or rather, I'm not sure that Descartes ever addressed the question, but his followers did. And they thought, same mental substance, the same soul guarantees personal identity. So you have the same soul. The soul is kind of a simple substance. 
Well, that's not, that answer won't do for us, but we're going to have to face the question of personal identity. What fact about each of us makes us the same person from day to day? Locke said, well, it's memory. You can remember things that happened to you yesterday, and you can remember things going back to your childhood. But Hume pointed out you've got a problem there because memory isn't transitive in a way that identity is. And Hume said, imagine the old general who can remember his life as a young officer. And when he was a young officer, he could remember his childhood. But the old general has forgotten his childhood. Now, are you going to say he's no longer identical uh, with the person who had those childhood experiences? I don't think so. So it looks like memory won't do the story about personal identity by itself because we want to say personal identity can stretch beyond memory. Okay, so this is another problem that we'll have to solve, and I'm just telling you what the issues are uh, because we'll get to them in the rest of the course. Now, that's really the end of, of the Cartesian questions, but I want to mention uh, some other questions that he did not uh, face because we're going to be uh, discussing them. And one of the crucial ones is intentionality. And remember, intentionality intentionality is that property of the mind by which it is about or of or represents objects and states of affairs in the world. And again, as always in philosophy, you got to allow yourself to be amazed by what any sane person thinks is just too obvious to be worth worrying about. I can now think about events in Libya or uh, events in Egypt. Now, what is it about this flesh in my skull, this hunk of matter in my skull, that enables it to reach out all the way to North Africa? How is aboutness possible? How can a, I mean, to put it in a vulgar uh, philosopher's way, how can a piece of meat be about anything? How can my brain be about anything? What is intentionality? That's, and, and, and that's the general philosophical question. And the, um, I, the specific uh, question is, how does it work in detail? And I think if we can figure out how it works in detail, then the general question will be solved. And I'm going to tell you in some detail how it works. Let me go back to the self uh, for a minute, because uh, there's something I forgot to tell you I want to tell you, and that's this. A lot of people think that the solution to personal identity is to see what makes me me is the same self. And I'm always aware of myself as a self. Now, Hume, I think, presented a, a pretty decisive skeptical argument against that. He says, I'm never aware of, my, of a self. If I turn my attention inward and I do what the philosophers do, I grab my forehead and think very hard, what am I really? And it sounds better in German, was ist das ich? Sounds like heavy duty philosophy. So I clutch my forehead and I say, was ist das ich? What is the I? Uh, and the answer is, well, what I actually experienced was my hand grabbing my forehead. I, it's true, I got maybe a slight hangover from last night. Oh, yeah, and then there's all those other hassles about my computer and all that. Uh, but basically, I never discover a self. Hume says, all I can ever discover are particular experiences. And even if I had a particular experience that was continuous, suppose there's a continuous yellow blotch, and I, I see that all the time, well, that wouldn't be a self. It would just be a yellow blotch. Elizabeth Anscombe was a, a famous philosopher, and she had an eye defect, and she could use this eye defect uh, to devastating effect in philosophical arguments. But if people talk about perception, she, she would say, I now see a large yellow blotch on the wall opposite. And she did. I mean, there was no yellow blotch there, but she had an eye defect. She could move the yellow blotch around by moving her eyes around. I, but I, if somebody said, well, that yellow blotch is the self because it's continuous. No, it's not the self. It's just a yellow blotch. What we want from the self is some principle that would unite all of our experiences together into a single unity. And Hume says there isn't any such a thing. OK, again, I'm going to come back to that 
Let me mention some more problems because this is what the rest of the course is going to be about, is this, this whole inventory of problems. Maybe I should take questions. I've, I've discussed the self, personal identity, and intentionality. Any questions about what I said about, about those? Again, I will say much more about those when we go into uh, detail. I, and I have, I'm fairly uh, comfortable with my accounts of these questions, but I'm not at all comfortable with my account of free will. I, I think it can't be. I don't have a solution, and I'd like to get a solution, but I don't have one uh, right now. All right, so let's go on. We got through intentionality. Now, the next one that Descartes, I, it's part of the Cartesian question, but I don't saw, see how he saw the special problem, and that is mental causation. I've been saying uh, throughout the whole course uh, that there's no question that mental causation exists. I decide to raise my arm, and the arm goes up. And this is characteristic of voluntary, intentional human actions. I can decide to do something uh, and then haul off and do it. But on my account, if mental states are irreducible uh, to neurobiological states, then, then how is it possible that mental states can function causally? As I've told you, various philosophers say, the physical world is causally closed. How can an irreducible mental phenomenon, this mysterious flash in my soul, how can that move my arm? Uh, okay, I've, I've already, in a sense, solved that by, uh, by discussing levels. But there is an interesting question, and that is, well, it's, what is the nature of the causation involved when mental states cause physical events? And typically, the nature of the causation is intentional causation. The intentional content, my desire to raise my arm, causes the very state of affairs represented by that content. It causes the state of my arm going up. How is that possible, and how does it differ from other sorts of causation. Okay, now I'm just going through these because we've now finished the first part of the, of the course, the mind-body problem, and I now want to go on and tell you how I think the mind works, uh, but we're going to have to discuss all of uh, these issues in the course of that. The next great question, and this is one that Descartes uh, did not face, and that's the notion of the unconscious. How is it possible that there can be unconscious mental states? And Descartes thought it, it isn't possible. Mental states are by definition conscious. So the idea of an unconscious mental state is the idea of an unconscious consciousness, as, as they would say, a manifest self-contradiction. I, I, they, I, they, the guys we're talking about would have thought and did in fact think that the notion of an unconscious mental state was some kind of a self-contradiction because the definition of mental required consciousness. Now, an interesting thing has happened in the past 100 years, or well, really in the past 50 years or so, and that is uh, people at one time were suspicious of the notion of the unconscious, but were quite comfortable with the notion of consciousness. That got turned on its head in psychology and cognitive science. So people become very comfortable with the idea that, well, you're following all these unconscious rules whenever you uh, understand a sentence or when you walk down the street. You're busy following unconsciously a whole set of cognitive procedures, a whole set of rules that you have. And you know the next step is to say, and in fact, those rules are computational rules. They're algorithmic rules. But in linguistics, for example, uh, in the linguistics that's de developed over the past half century, the standard account says you unconsciously follow the rules of English when you speak and when you understand other sentences. You automatically parse the sentence into the noun phrase and the verb phrase, the subject and the object, and you parse those into their component parts. You do that because you're following those rules unconsciously. But how is that supposed to work? What is the notion of the unconscious? It looks like, on the face of it, we've got two mind bodies for one. 
two, two mind-body problems for one. We had a mind-body problem about consciousness, but now it looks like we have another mind-body problem about the relation of unconscious mental states to the brain. How can there be mental states that are fully mental but totally unconscious? I, I don't think most people who admire Freud know how bad his account was of this. I looked it up. It, in 1915, he published a long article called The Unconscious. I mean, it's long. As I remember it's about 90 pages or so, and it took me forever to get through it, and I'm not sure I made it all the way to the bitter end. But what he says is this very interesting. He says, mental states in themselves are unconscious, and what we do is we bring some of them to consciousness by an act that's analogous to perception. You go and look at your mental state, and that brings it to consciousness. Uh, I think that picture cannot be made coherent. It's as if uh, the mind were like a dark attic full of all these mental states, and you want to be conscious of something. You go up in the attic with a flashlight and see, ah, oh, yeah, there's a desire. Oh, my God, that's a desire for Sally. Don't want that one. And then you go and look at some other mental states uh, that you have and shine the flashlight on them. I don't think that makes any sense. I don't think you can make uh, the idea of consciously bringing something to consciousness I, I, I coherent, but we have. But if we think Freud is wrong, incidentally, beware of German-speaking philosophers who use the expression "an sich," meaning "in itself," that uh, mental states themselves "an sich." Uh, 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 Freud tells us are unconscious. Uh, 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 Kant made the notion of the of "an sich," the things in themselves, uh, are somewhat mysterious. But in any case. Freud does not give us a coherent account of the relation of the conscious to the unconscious, and we have to do that in this course. We have to give uh, an account of uh, unconscious mental states, which will show how they relate to consciousness and how they relate to the rest of the world. Uh, and we have to try to do that without uh, creating another mind-body problem. I mean, one problem we're going to have is, are we going to say that these unconscious mental states have subjectivity. See, remember I've told you, conscious states have uh, ontological subjectivity. They only exist insofar as they are experienced. What about an unconscious mental states? Can we get rid of unconscious mental states? I don't think so. I think there are too many uh, good psychological experiments, and you can go look at them. Uh, there's just too much data that shows uh, people often act on the basis of motives where we can be uh, sure what the motive was, uh, but the subject himself or herself is, is unaware of the motives. And Freud actually gave a lot of good examples of this, and he wanted to give examples which weren't from his own clinical practice. He didn't want to take just examples from Viennese neurotics. Uh, so he had examples from things like hypnosis. And the hypnosis cases, I think, are pretty uh, compelling. Here's what happens. You put the guy under hypnosis, and then you give him what's called a post-hypnotic suggestion. You tell him that he's going to do something after he comes out of hypnosis. A uh, typical experiment goes as uh, follows. They tell the guy, um, uh, when <clears throat> you hear the word Germany, uh, Deutschland, this is where these experience, uh, experiments went on. Uh, you hear the word Germany, you're going to crawl around on the floor. Uh, okay, so you, a guy comes out of hypnosis, and you're talking about how much fun hypnosis is, and you wonder why more people don't practice it. And then somebody says, yeah, it's becoming very common here in Deutschland, here in Germany. And immediately the guy invents a story. He says, fascinating floor in this room. I just want to check out the floor. And then he invents a very plausible account. He says, you know, since the state budget crisis, they don't clean these floors the way they used to. And I'm going to check it out. Oh my gosh, look how terrible shape the floor is in. On the other hand, it's pretty good quality uh, tile. And my broker and I have been talking about investing and maybe uh, Armstrong flooring. That's one of the things we've been considering. And he'll go on and on. The guy has a very plausible plausible story of why he's crawling around on the floor. Uh, and he's, he's not lying. He's perfectly sincere 
in giving us this story about why he is behaving the way he does. But it's pretty also clear to us uh, that he has a motive of which he is unconscious. And there's, well, okay, these are old uh, experiments. There have been a whole lot more recent experiments. Nisbet and Wilson are two names that you should look up of people who've done uh, experiments that show that people often ask on the basis of priming or unconscious motivations of various kinds. And I'll go look up those again and come back to you uh, about that. I don't remember them well enough to tell you just off the top of my head. But it's pretty clear, it seems to me absolutely clear, that there are lots of cases where we need the notion of the unconscious in order to explain human behavior. Now there's a final on our list here. I'm sort of running out of blackboard space, so let me give you a number 12. <clears throat> there is uh, a problem about what we might call the role of mental phenomena in social explanations. And that has a deeper manifestation, and that's this. In a sense, the social sciences have been relatively disappointing. I don't want to diminish the achievements of the social sciences, but we don't have in, let's say, sociology or political science anything like the results uh, that we have in physics or chemistry. What sorts of explanations are appropriate for the social sciences? Now, the one social science that thought, no, we made it, we really are a heavy-duty science, was economics. Because in economics, it's become mathematical. Uh, they give Nobel Prizes uh, uh, for uh, results in economics. My, I, I have a lot of friends who do this kind of stuff. And my physicist friends who get Nobel Prizes look down on the economists who get Nobel Prizes. It looks to me like a pretty good deal uh, all around. But, the, but there's this pecking order among these prize winners. They don't think that, I mean, a, a famous physicist uh, told me that a Nobel Prize in economics isn't really a Nobel, doesn't really count. Um, well, okay, it's the same amount of money. Uh, but in, in any case, I, I, in recent years, like since the past two years, uh, economics hasn't looked so good. Uh, they did not uh, predict and, or even understand the great crash when it came. And we ought to have, have something to say about that. What were the assumptions that they were making? I think the assumption that they were making is that they forgot the role of intentional causation in the social explanation. They began to do equations in uh, economics, which looked like equations in physics, and it's not like physics. Even when I was a kid and I studied economics, they taught us that savings equals investment in the same tone of voice that you'd be taught that force equals mass time acceleration. Those are not the same. Force, if you understand F equals MA, you understand a lot about how the physical universe works. If you understand how savings equal investment, you understand the advantages of doing tautological equivalences when you talk about collective intentionality. Okay, on that mysterious thought, I'm going to stop uh, uh, lecturing today because we've run out of time.